time you're with us. Um, some of you, how many of you have read some of the work? Because all of you have, right? Everyone has. So we know. So Sandra Steinberg is the author of um, four books, and the books that, that I know the best are Living Downstream, Having Faith, and Raising Elijah. And um, all of them focus on issues of carcinogens in the environment and to toxicity and pollution and impact on humans and all biotic life. And um, she's, you know, I'll be talking about this a bit more later, but she's been called the Rachel Carson of today. Um, really interesting career of moving from being a biologist in the lab to being a writer and a public figure and a public speaker and a writer for the general public. Um, and one of the interesting things on this campus, we have this uh, communicating science program now, mm -hmm. and, and journalism. And it, I think you're really a great model of that, of being able to take science and bring it to to the everyday person to make it understandable and interesting too, not just understandable but fascinating. And um, so so and and then there's been this, you've had a really interesting change in your career where you're now really like an activist in, in, in the fracking movement. Um, so I don't want to say too much because I'm going to say more later, but um, that sort of let you. Okay, thanks. Um, well, uh, so first of all, thank you for all coming, and it's uh, a great privilege always to um, be in a classroom and do education. I, I, I do make my living full time as a uh, as an author now, and I don't have students of my own, so it's, I'm really uh, I think basically. What I do with my writing is teach, and with my impulse is to teach, so it's just really nice to be here, so thank you. Yeah. Um, so I thought I would just be very personal and autobiographical here, and I'm going to give a more formal talk with science in it, and sort of argument based um, in another hour or so, but um, I, I just, I'll just say a few things, because I would really like us to have a kind of conversation. Um, by saying that my um, so-called career was never really a plan, um, and, and and cancer is at the very beginning of it. So those of you who know living downstream know that I was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 20, um, and and it was really in between my sophomore and junior years of, of college. So I was a, I was kind of a high achieving biology major at the time, with plans to go on to medical school, um, but that um, commitment was not a really solid one for me when I was an undergraduate. And in fact, when I was in high school, I was um, more drawn to the humanities. I was in the creative writing club, I was in the school plays and things like that. And, and might have gone in that direction except for the fact that um, my mom was diagnosed with uh, metastatic breast cancer when I was 15. And she herself had been the first in her family to be able to go off to college and had this full scholarship in chemistry, actually. And it was really hard in the 1940s to be a woman in chemistry. So it was very hard, one, for her to have done that. And then I'm her adopted daughter. And in 1959, the kind of unspoken rule was you had to sign on the dotted line that you promised to be a stay-at-home mother. So my mom's story was all about having men had to make this terrible decision between motherhood and uh, a life as a woman in science, and so she threw away all the science um, and went, uh, in order to uh, have kids. And so my first memory, my mom and I actually is cracking fossils open <coughs> together on the front stoop, and, and I had a, a microscope by the time I was nine, and we looked at pond water. So my relationship with my mom was very much mediated by biology, and I, I was, uh, I liked it, I was good at it. And then, although I was probably going to go my own way with theater and creative writing and that, by the time I was in high school, it, when my mom was diagnosed and her prognosis was so grim, I, I just started to sort of carry her banner on, right? Only to then, a few years later, be diagnosed with cancer myself. And then I realized um, that although biology gave me a language to talk to, talk to my physicians about and gave me a, a way of understanding what had happened to me, as I could go into the medical literature and read all about you know, young people with bladder cancer, not very many of us. Um, but on the other hand, I realized that I was also um, exiled from my own generation, as it were. Um, this was 1979, and so uh, it's a time, I think that it was very brief, looking back on it, when Roe v. Wade had already passed, right? So, 
all of our, as women, all of our reproductive lives are sort of, I came of age under Roe v. Wade, but it was prior to the AIDS epidemic. And so there was this kind of time when life on college campuses was really a sexual carnival and nobody w worried about much, men or women. And even us, you know, nerdy biology majors who spent all their spare time in the organic chemistry labs sort of participated in all that. And because of the kind of cancer that I had, I couldn't. And I was always getting this infection or that infection, and I wasn't allowed to use birth control pills. And nobody used condoms in those days. It was, they were just sort of, unless you were using them like party balloons, right, as a, as a joke or something. So nobody had condom skills, certainly, none of my boyfriends. Um, and, uh, and so I had a hard time navigating that whole world. And being 20, I just felt uh, exiled from my whole generation. And so I, all that's a way of saying that to understand why I felt so alienated, why I felt um, like I lived in a different world, I really needed literature. Because literature, novels, um, poetry is all about people going through crises and feeling not, no longer part of something um, and having to navigate their way through it. So I was reading a lot of Adrian Rich, I was reading a lot of lesbian literature actually, because the, the, the experience of, of gay and lesbian people in the 70s, very closeted, very other, um, trying to find a narrative to talk about how you came of age in an entirely different world from everyone else, that spoke to my condition, as, as Quakers would say. Um, and so, um, so I, I was really reading when women's literature became really important to me. So I tried to be a double major in a, in a time when doing more than one major wasn't really unusual. <laughs> but my chemistry labs always met in the afternoons, which is when Shakespeare met. Shakespeare was always 2 o'clock in the afternoons, because you know, people that he met, he's never wake up early. So, <laughs> so uh, I was one sh Shakespeare class short of a double major. So I ended up then going and getting my master's degree in poetry, and then I went back into biology. Um, and then I became a biology professor for a while, I was on the tenure track. Um, and I was trying to be like biologist by day, poet by night, so I was actually doing performance poetry in Chicago and um, was in the newspaper quite a lot. Um, and I was worried my, the chair of my department was going to discover that I was out at late at night in the clubs doing poetry performance, not writing that um, grant proposal for the electron microscope we needed. <laughs> And so um, I, I was also still kind of closeted about all that. And, um, and then, then I quit and went off to Harvard. I had a postdoc there as a poet, actually. And then I did another postdoc in women's health policy at University of Illinois Chicago. And then another a position at, um, in women's studies at Northeastern. So I bounced around a lot. I, I mean, you'd have to call me a gypsy scholar. And, and none of this was really a plan. Except that I knew that I loved poetry and I knew that I loved biology. And to my mind, they're not opposites of each other. You know, they're both about the mystery of being alive. But whereas poetry simply says, behold, um, biology wants to solve the mystery. And there are two different ways of knowing. But they're both, I'd be hard pressed to say, you know, if I'm a biologist who does poetry on the side or a poet who likes biology. I mean, I, I mean they're both e equal. I, I kind of always refuse to subordinate one to the other. So it, so now I make my living as an author um, who writes kind of lyrical, lyrically about um, pretty awful environmental problems with the, the narrative strategy that if the writing is beautiful enough or funny enough um, or imagistic enough that you'll seduce your reader and they'll keep reading even though I'm talking about mass species extinction or, or the, the you know the trouble that the world's plankton stocks are in, and plankton make us half the oxygen we breathe, and what are we going to do? So I write about these kind of awful things, and there's a lot of silence, public silence around that you're just not going to. You know, you're gonna, you might stand around and talk about how crazy the weather is. Um, I hear all kinds of soccer moms, you know, I have young kids now, and talk about oh the weather's just crazy. But crazy implies we have no rational explanation, but, and we do. And somehow if you in, insert the rational explanation for our crazy situation, there's this, it's not really a conversation starter. It's very difficult for us to like, confront these things. So I'm always interested in it. Why can't we just, the environmental crisis to my mind is the human rights crisis of our generation. And we're not having a public conversation about it by and large. And so as a writer, I'm really interested in breaking the silences and finding a language for people to have conversations about. And so my evolution, since I became a full-time writer about 20 years ago, 
um, has been at first to imagine that I was doing the writing and bringing all the science to bear, putting all these jigsaw puzzle pieces together, translating it for people, and then that would be um, some good science for the activists who were actually at the very piece doing social change to use. Because I didn't really feel as a kind of squirrely writer that doesn't have really great social skills. <laughs> I'm not out there as a community organizer myself, right? Um, and yet, I finally decided that, that I wasn't doing en enough with that. That that was, I was trying to exhort my audiences to feel like they had agency over the situation and they had a role to play, and I myself was kind of not playing a role. I mean, I want other people to get out of their comfort zone and confront things and actually act. And writing is, I was sort of pretending that it was an action, but in fact it's not really. It's academic. Um, I was hoping it would trigger action on other people. So, it, so then a couple of years ago when I was the lucky recipient of a Heinz Award for my research in writing on environmental health, it's one of those things that kind of is like a windfall because you get this nice medal and you get to go to the Lincoln the Ford Theater or you know, when Lincoln was shot and have a nice ceremony in Washington DC, but it comes with a $100,000 check too, which is now a small amount of change, not for me anyway. And so I decided the best thing that I could do with that was rather than like help underwrite my next book project or do research, it would be hard to find a grant to do, which is sort of the time honored thing to do with the Heinz Award. I decided to use it to found a coalition of anti-fracking groups in New York State. So that, that became the seed money then for New York Against Fracking. And as the founder of the group, suddenly I was seen in the media anyway, not anymore as an author, but rather as an activist. And I could have pulled away from that, but I decided um, to take advantage of that and to sort of, so now I'm with people in the barricades actually, in the protests, with the bullhorn in my hand, sort of side by side. And um, so it's my life is different. Um, very different. I'm going to jail. And going to jail, which I'll talk about in my four months actually. Yeah, so I spent some time in jail this year. Um, and so, um, so why don't we just stop there? I've got a couple of video clips to show you about some of my more confrontational moments. <laughs> <laughs> Not really my, my personality. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yes, yeah, so it's it's a very different life than what I imagined at 18, sort of imagining writing about the beauty of nature as a as a poet. Um, so I just want to write things. I still write, I think, poetically. I think poetically. I, write, I think a lot about meter. Um, I often write in Shakespearean iambic meter because it has a kind of momentum and a flow to it that I think is a good meter, actually, for a call to arms. <laughs> um, I think about images and symbols and everything that poets do. It's just that they're at the service of not only just explaining science, but actually moving people's hearts and minds and convincing people to become active in um, confronting the environmental crisis. So did you want to begin with the video clips or end with the video clips? Um, I don't know. Why don't I stop there and just see how the conversation goes, and then we can, at any point we can show them. Okay. Anything, anything, everything's on the table here. If you want to ask very textual questions about the books, you want to ask science questions, it's autobiography, any of that. Well, I'll, I'll break the ice, okay, with a, now that you gave permission about textual questions. Yes. Um, because I'm a film, my, my main field is film okay. studies, and, and I've been writing about film for many, many years. And I was absolutely fascinated with, well, first of all, I loved the two commenters on, on the, the bonus features of the Living Downstream. Mm -hmm. And in one of them, I think it's in the first one with the, the director of the film, you say something to, to the effect that seeing the images that Chandra made to fit your book changed your, what, right. your own yes. way of understanding. You, 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 you say you actually say it made you think differently even changing those sentences. So I was very interested in the effect image word interaction or, or, or how the image actually okay. produces. Okay, I love that question. 
So, what, so a lot of you know, one of my books then was then adopted for a film and became this film, Living Downstream, which is the same name as the book. And so the film was made quite a bit, a number of years after I wrote mm -hmm. the book. And so it was at least a decade after the book had been published that the filmmaker approached me. So we spent, I spent four years writing the book, researching and writing the book, and then four years working with the filmmaker to film the book. Um, and um, so the process of actually making the film and seeing the rough cut of the film mm -hmm. changed my view on my own material. So as, the, as it became clear that the, the, this film was really going to be finished and that we had the funding and that it was going to have, look like it was going to have a nice, um, it had a shot in the various film festivals and it was going to have a nice theater run and all, on and on. Then um, my publisher approached me about reissuing the book and mm -hmm. um, and rewriting it to bring the science up to speed with the film, right? Because the film then we had we featured some scientists whose work wasn't in the book because it had been done ten years ago. So that this the evidence linking cancer and the environment has gotten much stronger since I wrote Living Downstream, and so. So while we were filming, then I also went to work rewriting the book. Mm -hmm. But because I was in the middle of filming with the filmmaker, some of the scenes and my experiences then found their way into the mm -hmm. book. And so the book is much an adaptation of the film, so the film is an adaptation of the book. So it's very, they work very collaboratively, right? And, and because I'm not actually a visual thinker, I'm very much sentence-based, I don't really know, I don't really have any insights in how filmmakers tell stories. Mm -hmm through the use of mostly visual media, but also the film score is really important. You, you, know, the, you can entirely change the tone, you can make something seem really scary just by changing the music. So I've seen these same scenes with different film scores over them, and it was like really sh shocking, because when I feel like I watch film as a, as a naive viewer, right, that I'm just sitting there and just taking it in and then having like, these responses, in, in a way that I suspect a lot of my readers are reading my books. And whereas when I read, I read like an author. I'm like, I'm looking at the, you know, the carpentry. Of, like I'm always thinking, okay, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. And how do, oh, there's an interesting thing for the flashback there, you know. And um, so I'm always, it's as though, you know, like I always imagine like a real carpenter who goes into somebody's house. They're always like checking how the corners are dovetailed or something. You know, they, they're seeing the world differently because it's their feel. So when I'm reading, I can't just read. I'm always, you know, lifting up the cover and taking a look at, at the parts and how it was done. I don't do that with film. I just watch it and have my experience. And so it was really interesting to me to see the process of the film and all these rough cuts and, and also see the, the scenes. It's almost like shuffling a deck of cards. You know, you put this scene first. Right, right. And, but if you put this other scene first, then you build up this sort of different sense right, of suspense. Right. Yeah, right. the audience has different expectations, and then so there's like a lot more moving parts, I think, to a film than there is to a book. And and so, um, but also because she's on the subject of the film, I had the opportunity to see scenes that as a a person, as a witness to my own life, I don't necessarily see. Mm -hmm. And, and that really hit me hard when I, I had, um, well, obviously the, the book goes back in time and it moves around a lot in time, actually. Film can't do that, not do documentary film, anyway. I mean, unless you had, like, historical footage or something. Um, and so we couldn't do in the film what is the exact center of the book in chapter six, where I tell the story of my own diagnosis finally, right in the middle of the book. Um, and, and I'm 20 years old, I'm in the hospital, and there's this whole scene. Um, since we couldn't re reenact and reconstruct that, what we decided to do for the film instead is to take the film crew into one of my cancer checkups, right. which I still do, right, every few months. And um, so then, all right, so I'll make two points about that. First of all, I, I ended up having bad news that day, and I didn't expect that, and neither did the camera crew or the director. So suddenly we had captured on the film this whole crisis. Um, and that made the film end in a very different place than we thought it was going to. Um, all right, so it changed the plot of the story. But then also, uh, in the, by taking the film crew into this room, 
that I go into every few mm -hmm. months, the, the camera's eye objectively records all these th things about the room that I, as a person who am in a state of high anxiety right. always, might not necessarily okay. notice, right? So, for example, there's a scene of me in the film undressing and putting on the back of blue cotton gown that is your sort of uniform as a cancer patient. Um, in, this, in this kind of back room, because they always give you these, they don't really have like formal dressing rooms, right? It's always some odd place that you're undressing in. And, um, and in this particular odd place was like the storage room in the urologist's office. A and on the walls were all these posters of male genitalia, because the main, um, you know, client, patient client, right? population of the urologist office are men with prostate problems. And so, uh, so it struck me as hilarious when I watched this as a person viewing the film that here it was this woman getting undressed surrounded by these penis posters. Um, I noticed it too, so it didn't fall. <laughs> That's the first thing I saw. Was the but you know, like I had walked in, into that room for that same room every few months for 15 years, and I had never noticed the penis posters before. Because I was always in my own head. I mean, I'm a pretty good anatomist, so normally I'd be really, I mean, I'd be used to some of the same posters teaching human anatomy, probably. But I just never saw them, you know? And while I was lying on the table, I always sort of make myself disappear into my own head. Um, I, and I'm not really not interested in what's going on with the rest of my body, because there I am, you know, with my legs in the stirrups, right. and the inside of my body is being projected on a large screen television. And now, this time now, they're fought, they found something, so they're all standing around talking about it. And um, it wasn't until, and I never look. I, I'm never. I'm not a looker. I've had so many, you know, bone scans, ultrasounds, every every bloody thing. And I like anatomy a lot, but I never look at my own imagery because I, I don't want to have those images in my head. Um, I'll look at other people's mm -hmm. medical images, but I won't look at mine. So, but I had to do that when I saw the film, right? And so there's these comedic elements that occurred to me that I that I yeah. have experienced, right? So then I could take the comedy of it since right. I've actually seen it now, and then write it into the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so they include the, pe the pe penis posters in the book, yeah. even though I, as a person, didn't notice them. I, the eyes, the view of the film. Yeah. That's very, it's very interesting. interesting. Right. Yeah, thank you. That yeah, this film is like that. I have a question. I don't mind if I jump in. So I'm really interested in how you use things like um, you know. You, Held up the breast milk and the, the fennel, and you talk about it in a very kind of practical way. So, but, but it seems to me like really domestic and maternal metaphors. And I remember seeing you in Albany, and you you had a you had a loaf of bread, mm -hmm. and you talked about the baker and the bread. It mm -hmm. just seemed like you really can bring in the reality of, of domestic life into a kind of contamination issue. Yeah, I guess I do. Well, the scene.